Man, Quentin, I am excited to share with you our special guest today, Mr. Hans Johnson. He's a speaker, recently minted author of the True Wealth Formula, How to Master Money, Live Free, and Build a Legacy. I wanna to welcome to the show, Mr. Hans Johnson. Hans, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Sal. This, Quentin, is, so, this is so awesome to have you. Um, just nice to meet you, man. Geeking out yeah. a little bit, Hans is a, is a personal coach of mine and, and among about a hundred or maybe even a thousand people out there. You've been helping people uh, get out of debt, to get them to master their money so that their money isn't a master over them. Um, we actually ordered three copies. So I, I'm holding the book right here. Uh, we ordered three copies, one for myself, two for our audience. And so we're going to be giving out those books and we're going to be ordering more and hopefully giving them out um, as the show progresses. Um, but I just want to get right into it. I want to learn about who you are and, and understand and introduce you to our audience. I know you grew up on the mean streets of Hawaii and you had a, you had a pretty rough childhood. And it, it, if it wasn't for a mentor, if I'm not mistaken, in, in martial arts, uh, that kind of set you on your way that's really what got you on the path to, to entrepreneurship and starting your own business. Now you, you run and own with your wife, uh, a multi-million dollar company. And, um, that's, that's exciting. I, I really want to be able to share with our, with our audience, um, some of the tips and, and tools that you, you got along the way to, to get them started, what they can be doing to mastering their money. So without further ado, Mr. Hans Johnson, thanks to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm excited uh, to uh, spend some time with you guys, and we'll we'll talk about uh, talk about the book, talk about uh, True Wealth Formula, whatever you guys whatever you guys want to uh, talk about. Have some fun. Yeah. So, what was it like selling Lay's at eight years old? Was that the first business? Yeah, that was the first business. Um, I talk about it in the book a little bit. Uh, you know, grew up in Hawaii. My mom was a single mom, and uh, you know. Uh, my brother and I were little kids, um, and, uh, you know, we grew up on, uh, welfare, basically, you know, didn't have, uh, enough, no, no stability at all. We moved every few months. Um, and, uh, so yeah, eight years old is the first business <laughs> come home from school, pick flower. There's a plumeria tree, uh, and it's a very fragrant, uh, flower. And, um, and if you've ever, I don't know if you guys have been to Hawaii, but, um, you can buy these lays and they're uh it's a it's a traditional uh flower necklace in the islands and um so i used to pick those flowers off those trees when i was a little kid i come home from school pick those flowers or saturday morning pick them and and uh string these things up go downtown to the tourists and sell these uh lays to uh we did that for uh you know school clothes for you know food and and other things so but it was a I guess at the time I, you know, uh, at that point in time, I was so young. I didn't, I didn't, uh, think much of it. I thought, Oh, this is kind of cool. I get to get to go out and uh, get around town, get out of the house, you know, roam around the streets and, uh, you know, um, and, and make some money. And, uh, so at the time, but, um, I was certainly learning some, some good life lessons. Uh, you know, uh, I'd, I'd say probably the biggest one, um, is, is, is the idea that if you want something, uh, there's always a way to get it you know, and, uh, you just gotta, and it don't, it don't matter. I mean, fortunately, yeah. I mean, you can say, okay, well you were, you were eight and you were living in Hawaii and, uh, but that's the, that's the case with everything. I mean, there's no, everything in life has advantages and disadvantages. And so, um, you know, fortunately, uh, there was a, even in the midst of, of that upbringing and the instability and all of that, um, you know, uh, very early, very, very, very young age, I learned that, okay, you know, uh, and then as I, as I got a little older, I would, um, you know, I think about that I'd go, okay, well, I want to do X or I want Y or whatever. And uh, we were super poor. Um, like I said, we didn't, we didn't have anything, but, um, if I wanted something I could, you know, it just kind of taught me that, okay, there's a way, you know, and I just go out and work, you know? And then when I got a little bit older, I was, um, that gig worked pretty good when I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, I kind of matured early, started growing hair on my upper lip at 11, 12 years old, you know, and, and uh, the little kid walking around with the bamboo pole <laughs> trying to sell flowers to the tourists. 
Uh, didn't, the didn't, voice starts to deepen a little bit. Yeah, hey, yeah, flowers. It as, <laughs> yeah, it didn't work as well. So then it, by the time I was uh, 11, 12, 13, I was doing landscaping, mowing lawns, um, other things. So, Did you have an awareness at that age as far as being in poverty, not having the money? You know, your parents are, are doing whatever that, that they need to do to bring in money. But were you aware that you were living in those conditions or or was just getting a job, something that you felt like you just needed to do so you'd have that extra spending cash? I, I'd say a little bit of both. Um, there's a lot of poverty in the islands. And, uh, you know, the neighborhoods that we lived in were, were, were rough neighborhoods. Uh, they were not. So it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, I, I knew that we didn't have things, you know, um, every school year you know, just to get school clothes was, was a, a difficult thing. School supplies. Um, again, we used back then, now it's those EBT cards that people use the, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> and they're buying stuff at the convenience store, whatever. Back then it was food stamps and, uh, you know, which we, that we'd buy our, our, you know, food with that. Um, but I, I, I guess, it, you know, it was a small town. I could get out and walk around. And so I guess there was this offset uh, of freedom. And so at a very early age, I, I, I became, uh, I think I had developed a, a real appreciation for freedom and responsibility. Um, and, and that has its benefits. It has its advantages and disadvantages, just like yeah. everything else. So Yeah, it does. You have, a, you have a quote in your book that says, the chaos in my childhood had another positive outcome, martial arts. Can you tell me some of the disciplines that you, you've gotten into? Yeah, so, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so, so being a white kid in Hawaii, uh, today everything's just hyper racist, everything, you know. Uh, and we live in a really, what I would describe, uh, and I, I mentioned it in the book, um, and obviously, you know, personally, I have some strong opinions about things, but one of the things, obviously not at that point in time, but kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, really became a student of history and particularly looking at the long cycle of historical patterns and human nature and really just from a line of, of questioning. But so today we live in this like super soft, you know, we're, we're physically soft, mentally soft. We're just and and that's that's a that's a symptom of 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 the of the of 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 the cycle that we're in um but uh back then you know and in hawaii hawaii is very multicultural and so i grew up as the minority um and it was just the way it was you know it was just survival um you know uh getting beat up after school getting chased by big freaking samoans and tongans and and uh you know, I was a stocky white kid that kind of has this look on my face, you know. So uh, by the time I was 12, I started started some martial arts training uh, with Damien, who ended up becoming my first wealth mentor. Uh, I talk about him in the book. And uh, but um, but that was uh, it gave me it gave me some much some some much needed uh, stability in my life uh, at that time, because, again, we're just bouncing around. No financial stability, no. Uh, residential stability. There's not a neighborhood in that side of the island that I hadn't haven't lived didn't live in growing up, and uh, so. But I knew that every Tuesday and Thursday night that that if as long as I showed up at that local YMCA, uh, that Damien was going to be there, and and that I that that I could just focus and train and learn. And at that point, he wasn't taking in any kids. He just trained uh, adults. I, I was his first first uh, you know kid student. Uh, that he took in. So I'll, I'll, I'll forever be grateful to him. Um, obviously the, the self-discipline, uh, the, the, you know, experience there, but then the, uh, the seeds that he planted were pretty, pretty huge, pretty monumental. For sure. We, we recently started taking my son and I Brazilian jiu-jitsu and one of the yeah. things that they teach you is just do something right. And, and you have a quote that you say in your group, um, the wealth builders, and, and even in the book itself, that no one is going to do for you what you won't do for yourself. And that, that takes action, that takes discipline, that takes a, a certain sense of mental fortitude and, and intestinal fortitude to just do something. And a lot of people talk about fight or flight, 
and I think you've brought this up quite a few times, but I know I've heard it elsewhere, is fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're seeing this cycle of fight, flight, or freeze happening right now during what you've been calling the corona, the corona crazy or crazy corona. Crazy. I've been calling it the corona circus. So, I mean, this is just an endless, vicious cycle of this fight, flight, or freeze. And now that states, especially where we're at in Texas, states are starting to open back up. We're starting to see that businesses and business owners are fighting for their business, for their small business. In previous episodes, we've had guests that we talked about. This is, this is a death blow potentially to American small business. Yet government is picking and choosing who are the winners. That Walmart who sells maybe 25% essential uh, materials or essential goods gets to stay open, but mom and pop small business don't. And so we're seeing a lot of businesses start to rise up and fight. Then we're starting to see people who are in the flight mode. They're like, no way, we're staying away. We're, we're locking our doors. We're not even thinking about going outside. And I think the freeze right now, especially in Texas is, okay, you guys go ahead and go eat at Chili's if you want to. We're gonna hang back for two weeks. We're just frozen. We, don't, we, don't, we can't make a decision. What are some of the things that you walk with your clients through to get out of that mindset of fight, flight, or freeze? Uh, well, you know, like I said, in the book, in True Wealth Formula, in the book, you know, it's, it's, it's motion. And the mind actually needs motion. And we're in a cycle in history right now um, where we're, we're caught up in this um, ever-increasing um, cultural phenomenon where we think that information is power and we're addicted to information and to knowing things. And part of this is feeding the natural state of, of, of uh, human, what I call human nature. Um, and it's also the, it's programming. You know, you've been programmed since you were, you know, however old, you know, getting, you know, sitting in front of a TV, going to school, you know, raise your hand, you got the right answer. Oh yeah, pick me, pick me. I got, you know, let me answer the question. And uh, so that's the programming. That's our system. It's constantly telling us that, you know, if, if you have, if you, if you can get the right answer, then you're smart and you'll be rewarded and you'll look cool and you get to look good in front of your peers. And um, the problem, and that, and that, that's okay back in, uh, in certain time periods. Uh, the problem with today, uh, there's a lot of problems with it, but one, it's just an information cluster fest. Um, and, and, and that's the first problem. The second problem is you have, you have an endless uh, supply of everyday experts. Any, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can get out there now and start talking a, a good story. And, uh, you know, and I'm not disparaging people that, that do this. That's fine. But it adds to the problem because it's so easy to pop open a camera and, and produce content and put it out there and have a strong opinion or be well studied and put out good information. And um, the more, the more, so the, the bigger, the first problem is it lends to the second problem, um, which is the more information there is, the more there's a need to be able to look and go, well, who do I listen to, you know? And then that leads, that inflates the second problem, which is anybody can just put out that information. And um, so, oh, okay, I must listen to this guy. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And, uh, and then the third problem is you can't freaking validate or verify any of it any of it, you know, and this is the problem with, with what's going on with COVID. This is the problem with what's going on with our economy. This is the problem with the entire financial industry. This is the problem with the entire medical industry. It doesn't matter which industry it is. You can go down the line and uh, the bigger it is, and there's more information you can't validate. There's none of the information or the data that's coming out regarding COVID right now. It's a cluster fest. Um, I started following this, this situation back in December. We started letting clients and family know in January and then more and more in February. And, and, um, but I was getting the information through the financial sector. Um, these politicians and these guys that get on radio and TV and these script reading talking heads. I'm, I'm, I have strong opinions, obviously. You know this, Sal, because no, you know me. But, um, uh, and so the, the question is, how do we function in this world today? And the answer to that that I found, and I talk about it in the book, and TWF is centered around this, one of these core principles. Yes, it's centered around the one that you mentioned earlier, which is no one's going to do for you what you aren't willing to do for yourself. That's radical personal responsibility and personal ownership. But the second part is, what do you, how do you function in a world and in a society where there is 
a, an over-surplus of information, an over-surplus of, of, quote, experts, okay? Um, and if you track these guys, they're not consistently right at anything. You know, they, they're giving uh, predictions and all this kind of stuff. You can't, there, there ain't a single person, don't matter if it's the government or somebody from corporate this or that or whatever, or some financial guru, you track when they make predictions, I call them the prediction pimps, uh, which is not a very friendly thing to say to people, but it's, it's you know, and this again is part of my journey and getting sort of uh, my, ec, ec, uh, extracting myself from this system, okay? Um, and so if you track it, there's the old saying that a broken clock is right twice a day. And the problem is, is human nature, we don't have a very good memory. And there's too much information. So you add up those three things, too much information, too many experts, can't verify or validate any of it. And human nature just feeds that cycle. So we're, we're peaking at this right now. And so in the case of, 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 of COVID and the economy and this big tug of war that's going on right now, there's, there's two realities going on. One reality is, you know, uh, you know, China, Italy, Iran, Spain, New York City. Uh, another reality is like our town, your town probably doesn't have uh, much cases. We live in a small town. It's pretty chill, you know? And so you've got this tug of war. And then the other problem right now is it's just all political, you know? And so when things become hyper political and then you got money in it, people are getting paid for classifying, you know, hospitals get a certain amount of money for classifying the deaths. How do you validate or trust any of the data? You know, it's just an absolute cluster fest. So it just gets back to that original premise. And I think that's, you know, the thing about it, it sort of surprised me as each year has, has progressed that TWF is not just a financial strategy. It's a life strategy. And, um, and it validates that that core statement. Nobody's going to do for you what you aren't willing to do for yourself. So how do you function in a world today where you can't validate the information, where it's too much freaking information? It puts you into information overload, which puts you into that freeze, right? That fight, fight, or freeze. And it, it, it gets you into that freeze type mode. So yeah, the answer is to recognize it. Um, you know, we got to be aware of the problem and realize that, hey, you know, and I, you, you've probably heard me talk about this, you know, okay, so here's all the information to, and, and you can sit there all day long and I'm, I can do it just like anybody else. Just dig and dig and dig. And why is this going on? What's that? And what's, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, there's only one thing that matters. And the only thing that matters is what is your action item? What are you going to do? And that's the case with all learning, um, especially today because the world is so complicated and it's so complex and it's so distorted and it's just, it just, the, the, you know, it's just a mess. So, so what's the action item? What are we going to do? And things like what you guys are doing, you know, homesteading, getting chickens and, you know, taking that personal responsibility, right. Um, to say, Hey, look, I may not have control over this global system that's going on out there. Like you said, where the government it's really, it's not, it's, it's government that are, it's a pretty complicated system, but they're picking the winners and the losers and, and, and the people that are getting, that are getting, that are really taking it as the small business owners and the middle class. Um, you know, so how do you function in that world? Well, the way you function is, is you realize that, okay, what is the thing I can do now? You know, what can I take responsibility for? And in some cases that might mean freaking getting some cook chickens going, man. Because then you know, hey, look, I can eat that chicken. <laughs> We're gonna get some eggs, you know. And I and and, and I can't. I can go shopping, and I can do hours and hours of research, and I can try to to know, oh, which corporate farm is really putting truth on their labels, you know, and saying, oh, organic, free range. Well, how do you validate that? Oh, well, some government organization says it. Oh, really? Because they never lie, right? They never make a mistake. They're never bought off. They're never lobbied against, you know? So this is the racket of this system that we live in right now. And the answer again, and this is the tug of war we're in, is radical personal responsibility, right? Taking back control, right? Um, localism instead of globalism. And um, what you guys are doing is a great example of that. It's interesting that you bring up a lot of topics or, or a lot of information with respect to control and letting go of things. 
do you have any background or, or have you done any reading on stoicism or anything in the principle that that teaches people to just let go of what's out of your control so in aa I've, I've not been a part of aa but i know enough about it in aa they have the the prayer the serenity prayer of god give me the the serenity to let go of the things I can't control. And if I can, then, then just go about your day, right? Do you have a background or, or, or any philosophy background that kind of keeps you grounded in that let go of things I can't control, focus on my four walls and, and moving forward and actually having that action plan? It's a, it's a really great question. Um, I don't have a, uh, a certified background or, you know, but, um, you know, anybody who's been married uh, for any length of time or gone through the trials and tribulations of life has maybe at one point in time been exposed to, you know, therapy or counseling or psychology. And uh, my background being in business and marketing and product development and then tying it into the financial side of things. Um, and then the historical context. So for me, it's just, you keep, you keep backing up. And I, I talk about this, it's mentioned in the book. We pound on it, as you know, heavily in the, in the uh, implementation program, the coaching and, uh, you know, system that we have, um, you know, with our clients, that context is everything. So how, it goes back to the same thing. It's like, how am I going to function in this overcomplicated society, in this system, right? that where, where knowing the information does, isn't enough. It doesn't work because you can't validate it, you know? And there's conflicts of information everywhere. So that's, that's screwed up. I, ta I call it the death of trust. And that's, trust is the fabric and the underlying currency that makes all currencies, all, um, you know, whether it's the US dollar or, you know, all, all systems, it's trust. And um, so we're, we're in a, an age of massive disruption. But so, yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it is, there is this process. And again, it, 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 it's the same thing if it's investing or managing money. Um, you know, True Wealth Formula is definitely about that. Uh, but there is that point where you have to say, okay, what, it, what and, and, and it could be a relationship that's challenging. And we probably all have had that. <laughs> Um, you know, where, where we're just like, God, we're trying to, trying to make it, we're putting all this energy into something. And I, uh, I'll give you an example. I went through a, an experience a few years ago, about seven years ago now, that was really, really, really tough. Uh, I mean, it was, it was absolutely brutal. And, um, you know, through some prayer, I, my background, I, I'm a, I'm a Christian. So, but not, not in the corporate church system. Uh, pretty, pretty critical of that. But so I think biblical, I think there's, and, and there's other philosophies and systems out there that there's a common theme. And, and if you can step away from the, um, uh, from, from the <laughs> organized system, the hierarchies of control and, 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 and authority sure. and identify again, it's, it's looking for context, but there is that theme. Like what is, what is it that we can, what is it that we can't control? But uh, when I was going through this situation, I, um, you know, through some prayer and meditation, I felt this, you know, what, what is, there's a, there's a, 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 a verse that says, um, you know, um, if you have faith, the size of mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Yeah. And I was resonating, you know, marinating on that, thinking about that. And I thought, God, you know, and then this, this, uh, voice kind of what I would call a voice, uh, my heavenly father, the creator said, what's, he said, son, tell me a, a, a mountain that's harder to move than the, than the, than the, the heart of a man or a woman. Wow. You know? And, uh, I thought about that and I was like, God, that's heavy because how many times have I tried to change my own heart, you know, or, or I've, I've said, mm -hmm. God, I got to stop doing this, you know? When there's nothing um, more I don't want to do this in the heart. And you, you know, we've all done that where we just keep doing it over and over again. Or, and then, and then here, and if you're in a relationship, you're sitting there and you're trying to, we all do it. You know, we're trying to <laughs> negotiate or use force or strong words or whatever to get someone else to change. Cause it's driving us crazy, you know? And, um, but no, it is true. Whether it's AA or whatever, what, what are the things, what, what, what do we have control over? You know? And uh, so when I, when I realize that when, 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 when I or you or anybody, when we realize that, boy, just changing myself is pretty tough. Yeah. Um, then we, it gives us a little, little extra grace uh, to, to realize that, okay, 
you know, and, 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 and to maybe be a little more aware of where those lines are. And then it's the same with this world system, you know. Um, again, another scripture is to be in the world, but not of the world. I, I, I have a, you know, train with a, I've known many friends over the years that are military guys, and I talk about the offensive mindset. Mm-hmm. And that, that sort of like, you know, uh, and I'm not, I'm not a big fan of this, you know, soft thinking, soft type of culture that we're in today. Um, and, and so I believe that that, again, that verse is, it speaks to, hey, get out there and do battle, you know. Um, and so, but how do we do that in this world today? It's a complicated right. cluster fest, mm. you know? So again, it goes back to what's my action item. You know, what can I do? It might mean have some chickens. It might mean help my neighbor. It might mean, uh, you know, slowly taking control of my own money and learning a proven system to manage my own money. Uh, you know, I talk about in the book, life is basically money and relationships, you can boil life down into those two baskets, man. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and money is resources, you know, uh, and it's always been that way. It's never not been that way. Today, it's the U.S. dollar, or if you're in another country, it's a different currency. <laughs> but uh, at one point, it was seashells, you know, uh, gold, silver, whatever. But it, it's just a representation of resources. That's what life is always, it's always been that way. It always will be that way. And uh, we're supposed to prioritize relationships over money or over resources. But um, for me personally, um, you know, coming from my background and, and, and kind of learning some of the things I had to learn along the way, I, I think it's an absolute crime that, that people will work their entire life and never learn how to manage their own money. Yeah. Um, What's a crime that they don't like, teach it as well as they should be or at all in, in public school? And this is one of the reasons why we homeschool and we implement a lot of what I've learned along the way through reading, you know, The Millionaire Next Door, The True Wealth Formula, uh, First Steps to Success, your wife's book. These are all things that I had to improve in myself first before I, I even thought about taking it to my children and to my wife. Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about fix yourself before you do anything right get up and make the bloody bed before you you can even tell somebody else to fix their own life and so you you talk about taking action and and the voice that was in your head telling you to do something or, or asking you to take action it took you 20 years to put this book together why now well i mean the book was a four year project uh it's 20 years of of it's experience longer i'd say maybe maybe 30 years. I'm 47. So, um, you know, I met Damien at 12. I don't know what, what, what age I was when he first spoke that, that, that first seed of, you know, the key to wealth is get your money working for you. And so you work for your money. Uh, you know, I've been working since I was eight years old, been on my own off and on at 12 permanently at 16. Um, so, you know, but it, it's at least, at least 20 years, um, of, of, you know, being out there, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think part of it, and I, I talk about this in the book, is that, you know, in the, uh, in the disclosures in the front, you know, the idea of writing something in, about the financial markets is, is it's, it's a very humbling idea. And, you know, there's more than ever people are writing this and that and everything. Um, it's easier than ever today, you know, and, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's also lends to the problem that I was talking about earlier. Um, for me, I've always been sort of fixated on, on truths that, that are not just trends. Um, tr- tr- truths that can weather the test of time. And, uh, and so a part of it was allowing that time uh, to bubble, you know, um, and, TWF is a living system for me. Uh, I'm testing it personally, constantly, uh, stress testing it. It's been stress tested. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, what I call a master strategy of how to manage your money, how to invest, how to think. Um, you know, we, we, because of what, you know, the things I was talking about earlier, we're really fixated on, I have a question, give me an answer. And when you're dealing with finances or money, there's no end to that. Yeah. 10,000 questions. You line up 10 experts, you're going to get 10 different opinions. So, you, you know, you, write, you read 10 books or 20 books or 100 books, you come away feeling really smart, but do you ever come away with a system? 
And for me, I was, I was, I, I was frustrated with that process. Um, I experienced it. I was very frustrated with the fact that I knew things in my head, but I would do, I wouldn't do it consistently. Mm. And like a prime example is cash flow assets. That's not a new idea. Give me a break. That's been out there forever. Um, you know, Kiyosaki obviously made it really popular in his, you know, rich dad, poor dad books been out there for 30 years now or something like that. But you know what? It's not like he invented that. Um, look at what, what look at what uh, Warren Buffett does. What's his investing? It's cash flow assets. You know, high quality cash flow assets. So this isn't a new thing. And um, but here I so 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 and people know this, but why don't we do it? Why do we not do the things we know? And 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 when we say, well, no, I do, but no, the statistics are now there, there are exceptions, sure. but the studies and the stats across the board, they 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 continue to validate the same thing. Markets boom and bust. The masses get in, in markets when they're peaking, and then they capitulate at the bottom. So we all know buy low, sell high, but, but we don't. That's not what we do. You know, yes, we have those one-offs, and we can brag and tell our friends and talk a story and all this kind of thing. Um, but most people don't buy and hold. They buy and fold, you know. Uh, and, and they just – and so, so to me, it was just this, this, like, part of my personality, my upbringing, and this – of just like, God, there's got to be something else here. And um, inspiration, I talk about it in the book, uh, Bruce Lee developed JKD, Jeet Kune Do, um, And he was a breakout in his time period in the 60s. Back then, uh, late 60s, early 70s, people think, oh, yeah, Bruce Lee, that was that movie star guy. He was actually, this guy was an innovator. Oh, my God. You know, and uh, he came up against the system. You want to talk about, you know, coming up against the system, you know, in the. In the well, I mean, uh, they wanted to kill him at one point. Oh, man. You know, and, and you, do, you, you do not, in the martial arts, you know, nowadays, MMA, you know, that's the whole thing. Well, who do you think, I mean, Bruce Lee is, could be argued he was the father of MMA. Mm -hmm. he, he was the first one that basically challenged that status quo and said, no, the, the, the system is not above the man. The man is more important than the system, you know. Yes, there are dominant systems in, in the martial arts. You mentioned Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, very dominant. Muay Thai, very dominant, you know. Um, you know, other Filipino martial arts, a lot of my background, you know, um, not initially, but then once I moved to California, very dominant when it comes to weaponry and the knife fighting and stuff like that. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, it's the man that makes the system, you know, uh, you can take the, the worst quote system, but you, you know, so he, so he recognized that and, and this idea of continual improvement, continual, um, you know, self-reflection and uh, you know and so I, I would say that um you know that had an influence and uh, just the quest of hey there's got to be a different answer and to me that answer was that there was no there was no master strategy um and when you combine meaning that you get all these ideas you read all these books you go to seminars you get all this information and you're becoming you're becoming a really dysfunctional dumb genius you know you're becoming really smart up here but but where's the results, you know? And if all of this information was helping people, and if all these experts were helping people, why, why, why do we just go from the strongest economy in 50 years, okay, the longest running bull market in history, and within literally two to four weeks, people were broke, oh, yeah. right? And, and, I've been, and you've been hearing me, I've been telling people, I'm like, look, if you're, if you're having a financial problem right now, and this is a terrible uh, mean thing to say. <laughs> uh, nobody likes it when I say this, but this is part of that tough medicine that if we want our future to be different, what I've been asking people is how many more times do you want to go through this? You know, uh, the, this dot com bust, you know, the global financial crisis in 08, and now we're long in the tooth in this bull market, and then COVID comes along. Oh, COVID did it. No, COVID didn't do it. I mean, come on, every market booms and busts. And so how many more times do you want to be a freaking victim of the system? You know, and if you're, if you're suffering right now financially and we're like six weeks away from, from the economy locking down, it's a little more than uh, six weeks now, let's say it's just called it, uh, two months. Okay. But um, when I first started talking about this, I said, look, if you're a couple weeks out of it, even now two months, if you're two months away from the long, the strongest economy in 50 years and the longest bull market in history, and you're two months away from that, and you're having financial problems, it has nothing to do with COVID. 
You know, oh no, you don't understand. I lost my job or my business has been shut down or whatever. No, I'm sorry. It is a physical impossibility. Your money management management system and philosophy is wrong. Keep going. You can't have it both ways. You cannot, you, you, in no universe in this, in the world, can you have it both ways? You cannot go from the strongest economy in 50 years and the longest running bull market to two or four or six weeks or eight weeks and have money problems, you know? And that is a rough message to tell people. Oh, yeah. I know people are hurting right now, you know? I know that there are people really hurting right now. But, that, but how much of that is, is self What's you? next? What's your action system? How are you going to come out of this stronger? Yeah, I mean, that's a self-inflicted wound. A, a lot of our financial issues are self-inflicted. It's, it's self-inflicted because right now bankruptcies are soaring, right? Defaults are soaring. We're at the very beginning of this. The Fed and the government, they're all pouring in money and all this sort of thing. And, um, you know, we're, and, and, but, but the, those, those defaults and those bankruptcies and all that, and, and we're at the very front end. Those aren't soaring just because we went from the top to then boom like this, you know? That's because of too much debt, right? Living for years. Years and years and years of living on the edge, living above your means, right? Too much consumer debt. And then on the, inve the quote, investing side, which we make a pretty, a pretty strong differentiation between investing and speculating, but using too much leverage, you know? Um, and so, and that kind of thinking is, well, times are good. You know, cash is bad. And um, there's never been a time in history where we don't, where you don't have these kind of events happen. You know, we're in a hundred year cycle event right now. Um, there's nobody alive today that's ever, that has ever lived through what we're going through right now. So it's, you know, it's, it's a wide open, you know? So, um, so it is a harsh message. It is, it is hard and it is self-inflicted. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't create COVID. Um, we didn't make the decisions that the government made, what economies shut down, which ones stayed open, all this sort of thing. We didn't have, we didn't have any control over that, but that's life has always been that way. It's never freaking not been that way. There's always been random events that, that happen, you know? So, um, so that's the TWF, you know, mindset of, of living, of managing money. And uh, it, could, it could be applied to health, you know? Uh, it could be a lot, applied to other resources, like what you guys are doing, the homesteading projects and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, and these, these kind of trends are going to probably accelerate coming out of this. So I have a question for you, Hans. Uh, yeah. You've touched on a lot of stuff that me and Sal really like to talk about. And some things that we've been talking about lately is the system is basically, I don't want to say rigged, but it's broken, right? And it feeds off social issues and dysfunction, and it's created a lot of them. And we're living in a time where we basically have like an anarcho-techno tyranny. If, if we're not in it already, it's, it's closely approaching, right? And so a lot of people are talking about building a community. It's one thing that Sal and I are trying to accomplish. We want to build a community of like individuals or people who care about issues and want to take personal responsibility seriously. And, but a lot of people are too focused on fixing the problems of the system. Oh, the system's broken. We have to fix it. We have to do this. We have to do that. But like you said earlier, you know, it, we were talking about the serenity prayer and there's like a lot of, a lot of stuff that we just can't really handle individually. And we don't have communities. We don't have communities because we're personally dysfunctional. We yeah. don't have good discipline. We don't take responsibility for ourselves. So I would like to hear from you how an individual can lay down the foundations of personal responsibility and move towards building a community, what that would look like, how they could succeed off of that system, and how we could change the community from the ground up. I think you would have a great idea on how to do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with what you said. I mean, um, it, 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 we are dysfunctional. Um, we don't have real problems. We have, no. we have fake problems in our head. Um, our society is so prosperous. We're too prosperous as a society. And this is part of the cycle of human nature. And you can see it through all throughout history. And the more prosperous a society comes, uh, becomes, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not out there going on a weekly hunt that if I don't bring it back a Buffalo or, or, or something, I, I'm, I mean, I either come back alive with a, with, or I, or I, I died and fell into some crevasse or, um, you know, or, or came across a warring, you know, tribe or whatever. And, and this isn't a bad thing. It's good. You know, uh, that's what we want. We want a more stable, prosperous, 
society. But when, uh, when our biggest problem is, is, oh my God, I can't, uh, my, my local economy shut down. I can't go freaking through my damn, uh, Starbucks drive through, you know, get my nails or, done. um, you know, frick, net, I've already watched all the Netflix uh, shows. There's not a new one. Uh, kinda, you know, I mean that those aren't real problems. So, so, um, so what you're talking about, absolutely. So we're, we are, uh, so it is, it's that self-reflection I talk about in, in TWF and it's part of the core kind of philosophy is that less is more. And so I think a big part of it, and this is the good side of, of what's going on right now, um, is that we, a lot of people are learning right now that all that extra stuff you think you need isn't actually making you happier. It's not actually adding value to your life, you know? Um, and so, you know, stepping back and realizing that, hey, um, I don't need all these extra things. I can, I, can, I can get more joy and fulfillment just by uh, going out for a walk or, or whatever. Um, as far as the local community issue, that is the answer. Um, you know, the founding fathers, when they crafted the Constitution, they understood the balance very well. There is a need for a national system, particularly if you're talking about uh, national defense and things like that. Um, but you've got to limit the size of that thing. And um, what the problem is right now in our system is this has gotten so it's gotten too big. And it doesn't matter if you're conservative or, or liberal or whatever side it is. It's both sides. Uh, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't take a stand for things we believe in and what we know to be right and wrong, that we should give those fights up. But you have both sides that are fighting for power for that weapon called the national government. And, uh, it's, and, it's, and it's like a weapon pointed in your face. Um, because, you know, if, if, if you agree with me, well then, hey, cool, man, you get to be on my side. We get to point this gun at everybody else, you know, but if you don't agree and I'm in control, I got that thing pointed right at you. And, and that, and that doesn't feel good. It sucks, you know? And so the people that, um, are on the other side of the political spectrum from, from the quote controlling party now, they, after eight years of being in control at the federal level, when that election happened in 2016, that freaking cannon swung around and all of a sudden now they had it stuck in their face. They're like, oh my God, you know, and, and, and that threat is very real. I don't have to necessarily agree or disagree with their politics or their value system or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> the answer to this whole thing is decentralization. It's, it's, it's that, you know, the, the original concept, the 50 states were supposed to function like 50 different countries. I love the fact that California is not Texas and Texas is not California. I love that. I have family in California, Hawaii, different places. I like to visit. I love to live in Texas. You know, um, I don't want to make California, Texas any more than I think Californians should want to make, you know, but that's not the system we're in. It's everybody trying to force, use force to make everybody else like themselves. So yeah, the answer is localism. It's decentralization. Um, it's taking more responsibility, building those local communities. Different people are better at those. I, I, my struggle throughout my life has always been the relationship side. And that's why in, um, in the book, uh, I talk about the rich, miserable bastard and the happiness, uh, the money versus happiness quadrant. And, you know, that's kind of a reminder to myself. It's like, it's a, it's a check for me. Like, hey, hey man, you're getting in, you're, you're too far in that R&B box right now, bro. You need to freaking get your, sorry, get your stuff together and, and uh, you know, Focus more on relationships and spending quality time with loved ones. So, so the relationships is a priority and, and networks, if you're talking about localism, because those networks, there's accountability there, right? We have a system, and this is probably going to rock some boats right now. We have a system right now where people will go to some kind of a, uh, again, whether it's government or religious or whatever, and surrender authority over themselves and their family to some person, they don't freaking know that person. But because that person is famous and on TV and authored a bunch of books and talks real smart, okay? Now, if the three of us grew up in the same village together and we've been out on hunts, we've been out, we've been, we've, we've been out you know, bringing home food, fighting wars, right? And if we know each other and we have that kind of relationship, and you have an elder in the village and you know, you're, you're, you're mistreating somebody or uh, you're off track. That elder is going to come to you and say, Hey, uh, uh, you know, 
And, and you know what? You're going to respect that person. There's going to be a mutual respect. There's a chain of command. Why? Because you guys have lived together. You know each other. That, that transparency is automatically there in that local system. But we have no transparency and no accountability in our system right now. So, so it's, a, it's a cluster fest. They're, they're, they, uh, historically, I mean, obviously all the things like taking responsibility and all the things that you guys are doing and that we're talking about is critical. Identify what are the things we can do with what we got. Do, I always say do the, do the best you can with what you have. But at the end of the day, and this is the part that sucks, historically, it usually doesn't really change until it hits the wall. Because there's so much, and you see this now in our country, unfortunately, there's such a high percentage of people that are becoming dependent on that system. And they're feeding on that. And you got it at both ends. And you got it at the, at the you got the corporate welfare, and then you got the bottom side. And again, the small business owner and the, and the middle class are getting squeezed. So what do you do? You prepare. You, you keep that situational awareness. You, you, you stay aware of your surroundings, right? You don't get so far down the rabbit hole that you lose that situational awareness in that context. And, and that's, that's hard to do. That's easy to do nowadays because we can access so much information. We, we want to know the answer. What's the answer? Right now. Yeah, exactly. So the answer is keep that situational awareness, right? Keep your mobility, right? Keep your ability to, you know, uh, we talk about developing, um, you know, new economy skill sets, you know, skills that allow you to earn a living in, in situations that allow you geographic mobility, right? So that obviously leans, leans more towards technology and such. The problem with that is in an EMP situation or some type of technological disruption, you also have to have those old world skill sets. So, so if you balance that out, like, having chickens, having developing that local community, but also developing those new economy skill sets where you can work remote, do some coding, some programming, content development, you know, that type of thing. But um, sadly to my, the, the general pattern, there's always exceptions to the rule, but the general pattern is, is that things that get this big typically don't change until they hit the freaking wall yeah. and it sucks. And when it happens, it's, it's not good. So um, and they, they do break down. Nothing's invincible. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with respect to the, uh, the pattern recognition and what you see coming, you were talking about, you, you were talking about this back in December. I know Quentin and I, we were talking about it right around the same time saying we're going to be in lockdown till June, right? This was, this was back in January when no one was even talking about lockdowns. You're like, they're going to lock this down. This is June. If our audience can get a takeaway, I know we're, we're pressed on time. We've got about five minutes left with you. If, if our audience can get away with just a small piece of information from you, a small takeaway, the, the big why in your book is, is leaving a legacy. But what is, what is someone to do right now who's lost that job or who's furloughed, who hasn't been saving up? What should they be doing? What is their action step other than going out and picking up the book the true wealth formula, what, where do you want to send people to get this information? Yeah. I mean, pick up the book. Absolutely. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, I think uh, it's still hitting some bestseller lists and stuff like that. Um, you can, uh, and, and go to the website, truewealthformula.com, register at the website, get the free reports, get the other free videos that we have. Um, you know, if you're at a point where you're like, okay, I, I really need to make a change. I mean, if, if there's anything that we've said here in this, um, you know, a uh, podcast that resonates and you, and you say, God, I, I, I'm not in a good situation right now, but there is a pattern. And unfortunately I've been on the wrong end of this pattern and I can't do this anymore. I got to make a change. Then get it, get in. We have that. We have an implementation program. It's less than the price of a cup of coffee a day. I set that up so that I could develop long-term relationships with our subscribers and work with them to get these ideas and these concepts and master the thinking because until I get that thinking, and I, I, you got to go through a reprogramming sequence um, because you're battling against human. We, the global system is a debt. It's a, it's a global debt based economy that is, that feeds on debt slavery feeds on overconsumption and hyperconsumption. 
And uh, so for most people, the first action item is to free themselves from that because once you're no longer a debt slave and you learn these concepts, you start thinking really different, start seeing the world in a very different way. And, um, and then you also start to, you also start to weigh the cost very differently of where you invest your energy. And you realize that, okay, I can get really sucked down this rabbit hole or I can learn enough and then I got to step back and go, okay, what's my action item? You know, what can I do today or this week that's going to move my family? And Sal mentioned it earlier in the back of the book, I talk about legacy. And that should be the reason for creating wealth. There's a lot of different reasons to create wealth. Money is a tool um, and it's, it's resources. So what's the legacy that I want to create and leave behind? Money is not the only way to do that. But if I can free myself from debt slavery and I can reach my freedom number and I can identify what is that number where I'm no longer working for money, but where money is working for me. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stop working because working is a joy and working is a privilege and it's an honor. And it actually is really important when, when I don't want to get too far into it, but this system wants to create, like you said, it create dependency and create dependence. When we're not working, it's not good. A man needs to work. And we got a lot of young people nowadays that they don't want to work, you know? And uh, so it's, it's good. It's a good thing. There used to be a rite of passage into manhood, you know, uh, to get out there and yeah, do the hunt, the work rights. and farm and do that. We don't have those anymore in our society, you know? Uh, the rite of passage is to sit on a couch and do video games. You know, I mean, it's, it's. I leveled up. <laughs> yeah. That's your rite of passage. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, so, so it's good to see you guys and, and, and you guys are a good representation for your generation. It's really important. Um, you know, we really need that. We need to spread that like a virus that, that the, the reward of being free, you know, here first. And then creating, managing our money, being, being a good steward of what we have, you know, and learning, learning the system to where we can man, be, you know, manage that resource and, and, and pr create some, uh, some self-reliance like you guys are doing with the, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, chicken farms and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, no, we could, uh, it's probably good for now. Maybe we'll do another one someday, but I, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, I uh, awesome, appreciate, appreciate the chance to, to uh, meet you, Quentin and, 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 uh, absolutely chat with you, Sal. And, uh, Thank you, I hope really to meet you guys in person sometime in the future and just hear your stories and, and, and your progress and what you're doing. And, and uh, here's what I would say. I said this recently to people, you know, right now we're in this thing where, you know, it's like, Oh, the reopening of America, it's this big campaign. And, um, <laughs> so, I mean, this show is like, yeah, you know, it's like, we went out of business and now, oh, grand opening again, you know? <laughs> um, and that's, that's so Trump, you know, it's gonna, <laughs> but, um, and it's important, you know, the economic impact and everything like that. It's really important, but I've been, I've been telling people, be careful. If you've been in lockdown, you, you know, and you've been suppressed, you want to just get out and do stuff. You want to splurge and get back in. And they've been selling everybody on, Hey, it's going to be this V recovery and going to go back to normal and it's all going to be okay. And, um, you know, bear no markets and, and, and bad recessions and depressions. I know the Fed and the government, they're, they're throwing a ton. They're throwing the kitchen sink at it. And, you know, that will eventually lead to an inflationary type situation. There's some specific thing. The U.S. dollar to become a hyperinflationary, it's not just, quote, money, what people call money printing that's going to make that happen. There's some other stuff involved in the U.S. dollar most people don't understand. But um, th th be careful right now realize that this is a time to be hunkering down. Yes. Celebrate that, you know, you get to go to the park. I mean, I can't believe some of these videos in these places, they're chasing people out of parks and, you know, beaches and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But this is a time because when, when big events like this happen, it's not just a month or two. I mean, these things play out over time. It's going to be minimum one to two years before we have a clear picture of what the real damage is and what it, what it was and what it is and what that looks like to play out. And so I think, you know, now if you have the resources and you want to speculate and you want to take some strategic gambles, 
have at it. There might be some good values out there in different asset classes, but <laughs> for most people, this is the time to be hunkering down and to be building a position of strength. I call it building that tier one asset base. We, we know that as cash and cash flow, cash and cash like assets and chaos hedges. This is time to be building that up because you want to be in a position of strength. And I think that the no, 100% one to two years is going to be when you, you have more clarity. Um, these things just typically, they, historically, they don't resolve quickly. And we can say, well, no, it's, this time is different. Yeah, there's a lot of differences between the Great Depression and the Fed has been more responsive and, you know, on and on and on. But man, human nature doesn't change. You know, so when I sit here and I say, oh, no, it's different. We're in a, our, we have a more advanced society and the Fed is in a different thing and this and that. And I come up with all these micro things to, to rationalize why it's different. Short term, that argument might play out to be true. But long term, human nature does not change. It has been we, we have been what we are for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it will cycle back, you know, so. People need to be preparing. They need to be preparing for this thing's going to roll. It's going to roll in waves. And um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, but the, the key to be able to capitalize on that, he's got to be in a position of strength. Hans, so you, tell, you well situation to build that position of strength. Hans, tell the audience one more time where they can find you, where they can pick up the book, and uh, how, how you know we can get a hold of mention, you. We didn't mention the app. I mean, the book, the book is at Amazon.com. True Wealth Formula, How to Master Money, Live Free, and Build a Legacy. Uh, then you want to register at truewealthformula.com. Uh, in the book, we define what is true wealth. Um, true wealth is actually inner wealth and inner strength. Uh, but we do need those resources. That's important. We were never told. There's never been a teaching that says, no, that's, don't do that. That's all evil. No, it's the priority. Uh, because if you say, well, no, the money is the root of all evil and you know, a rich man can never, okay, well, I can, I can quote you all kinds of other stuff that say the exact opposite, you know? So we got to step back and get the context. And the context is there's a priority there. And we're not supposed to uh, put worldly things or possessions ahead of relationships. And we are supposed to prioritize our relationships. Creator, my relationship with my creator, myself, my spouse, my family. We're supposed to work it out from there and prioritize it uh, from there. But, um, and then uh, the app wealthbuilder.io, we have an app that's, that's, um, that goes in conjunction with the book. And uh, we're doing, uh, the app's a long-term project. We've got some cool stuff that we're doing with that. It's very, um, very thorough. Really dash. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on that. Um, we actually use the subscription uh, revenues to fund the app development and uh, just basically taking the formulas and the systems that are in here and building it more and more into software and more into an algorithm type uh interface so we're 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 uh some cool stuff that we're doing that amazing calculators you can sit there and punch in your numbers and find out you know see exactly uh, we're, we're building that into some um simulators and and uh some dashboards that are just going to be super cool so that's awesome. that's awesome as we mentioned we are giving away two free copies of the true wealth formula it's not much i wish i could do 20 30 40 100 copies but we are giving away two free copies at newnormalpod.com forward slash TWF. That's true of formula, newnormalpod.com slash TWF. You can register, sign up for that. We will do a drawing. Hans, we'd love to have you back on just for five minutes to do that drawing. We'll send you the names. You can pick them out of the hat. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. This was, this was a treat for me, a personal, uh, personal big get for me. So thank you. Absolutely, man. Uh, Thanks, my, man. My 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 privilege and honor and i i appreciate you guys and it's good to meet you quentin i hope we get to meet sometime Great meeting you. and uh, so I'll keep it up. you guys keep spreading the good word and uh keep provoking people to take action take responsibility i appreciate you guys supporting the book getting that message out there um and uh yeah we'll do it again sometime thank you so much as Thanks, always man. stay safe and welcome to the new normal <laughs>